Hello, everyone. Is anyone there? Yes. Yeah, we're here. How are you? Hi. Um, well, I'm in Wyoming on a road trip. Hi. Um, just uh, off, I stopped at a um, rest stop to do this. And here I am. So are we underway, um, Kath or Aaron? Shall I yes, just? Yes, please okay. go ahead. So everyone who's here, welcome to the uh, fireside chat. And I'm John Liu. And today we're going to be taking you to Bolivia to look at the, the developments in a beautiful camp there. It's very interesting. I'm sure you're going to find this fascinating. And I'm going to say a few words because I think we're in a very important moment in history. Um, I think it's the ecosystem restoration camps movement has a chance to have a significant impact on the situation that we see ourselves in now as there are more and more disruptions from the pandemic, from economic issues, from uh, violence in different places, refugee situations. And so I just wanted to say that the more I think about this, the more I realize that the camps have uh, a huge possibility and opportunity to serve their communities, to make sure that no one suffers unnecessarily. If we put together central kitchens and we put together ways to train people who are marginalized or, or disaffected from the society to do ecosystem preservation. It will have an enormous impact on those individuals and make their communities and their landscapes more resilient. And we also have to consider um, that what we're seeing is with widespread drought, multi-year droughts, multi-decade droughts, wildfires, extreme weather events, and so on, our ecological systems suffering. So regardless of what the economic or social systems are, we really need to focus on water and soil and plants and biodiversity. So this is what all the camps are working on. The more people we engage and train, then the less sort of depressed people have to be because you can actually see improvements in the hydrological cycle in soil, fertility in the numeric numbers of plants and in, in the earth. So this is, this is all extremely important for people and hope and gives them purpose. And one more thing that I've been working on, and I, I want you to know, ecoflix.com. Can people mute now, those who are muted? Um, there's, a, there's a new streaming service called Ecoflix, and it's at ecoflix.com. So E-C-O-F-L-I-X.com. And we have the ability to bring together all of the camps. We'll have the opportunity to share their, their information through Ecoflix. Other organizations like the Global Eco Village Network, like Permaculture Training, um, will be able to, to share their materials there. Organizations like the Society for Ecological Restoration can also join us and others. So we'll be able to curate an area that is being called Earth Restoration, the Great Work of Our Time. And there we can 
celebrate all the camps. We can um, tell people about which are the most effective and show people which are the most effective methods for infiltrating and, and retaining moisture and propagating and planting out. And there's some very interesting areas that, that I've noticed. One is um, we're working with prisons uh, in the United States to create botanical sanctuaries. So this is of huge comfort for the inmates and it's very satisfying also for the guards. And it is of enormous value for the society and gives it's great satisfaction to everyone who's participating in it. And it also gives skill sets that allow inmates when they get out of prison to have meaningful lives and, and uh, work forever. So these are the kinds of things that I'm interested in. And if anybody is interested in those, please contact me. Uh, my email is johndliu at icloud.com. And uh, you can reach me at any time through that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron, who's going to share some camp information from the movement. And then we're going to hear from uh, Minnow about the um, camp in Bolivia. So thank you very much for listening and, and welcome again to the Fireside Chat. Thanks so much, John. And welcome everybody who's here. It's so lovely to see some familiar faces, um, some folks who are returning, um, as well as some, some new um, people in this group. Um, our event will be about an hour and a half um, with a bit longer um, for you to engage in discussion afterwards. We have a very special speaker for you. Um, and I'll just share a little bit about the way that we um, will organize today's chat. Let me just make sure that I'm not covering the slides. Can I get a thumbs up if it looks okay? Awesome. Um, so today we have Menno starring from Camp Tokai in Bolivia. Menno will be giving um, a presentation and we'll ask you to hold your questions until after the presentation. And you can do that either by raising your hand um, and turning on your video and raising your hand. Um, you can ask a question in the chat and we'll try to make sure that that gets covered um, or you can digitally raise your hand using the Zoom um, raise hand feature. As I mentioned that our session is about an hour and we'll have um, open discussion at the end. A couple of updates from um, what's going on at ecosystem restoration camp sites, partners around the world. Um, upcoming experiences include Camp Coyote in California. They're having their spring camp week from the May 13th to the 15th. So if you are in Northern California and would like to um, join them, they would love to have your participation to do some restoration activities that they have on site. Camp Embercombe also, uh, in the UK, will be doing their spring rewilding um, in-person experience from May 26th until the 31st. So if you're looking for an opportunity um, in that region, um, take a look at our website uh, for more details and information. And then finally, Camp Dryland Solutions in Somalia is organizing their permaculture design course with Sa Sam Parker Davies from September 19th until the 2nd of October. Um, some other updates from our camps as well. In Camp Contour Lines in Guatemala, local farmers and community members are producing regenerative food products and some of those products will be available internationally. So stay tuned for more information about, um, about those lines. Um, Camp Tanganyika, in Tanzania has been using a holistic approach for conservation and ecosystem restoration um, that includes local farmers in food gardens, um, excuse me, in forest gardens, um, 
as well as a conservation approach that is protecting primates and pangolins. So if you are a pangolin fan like I am, you should definitely learn a little bit more about their project. Um, Camp Salta Chiroy in Ireland is partnering with a housing estate to train res residents to do ecosystem restoration and increase biodiversity in their backyards. And next month, you can join us to learn a little bit more about what's going on at Camp King's Garden in the Netherlands. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Menno, um, who's the camp manager for Camp Tukaya in Cochabamba. Um, Menno, would you like to kick it off or should I open with the video? Uh, just open the video, that's fine. Great, here we are. Hi, my name's Ben. Uh, I'm here in Chukaya at what will be the agroforestry site. Uh, so this is a, a big project on five hectares of land behind me. Uh, they'll be, we'll be planting around 3,000 fruit trees, around 6,000 association trees, that's native trees with the fruit trees. So yeah, there's great potential in this site. The main incentive for this project is a dual purpose thing of helping combating climate change to execute a design which works and sets an example. The other aim of this is to make it productive for the people. Yeah, thank you, uh, Aaron. Uh, thank you, everyone uh, listening, watching. My name is Menno and I'm uh, originally from Holland and uh, I'm working in Bolivia most of the time. Uh, one of the things is this uh, Camp Chokaya, Eco Camp Chokaya. Basically, we uh, arranged it uh, with the ERC, the Foundation Samai and the local uh, partners here in Bolivia. Next slide, please. So this is the latest uh, one we uh, produced in the Chukaya camp, the water reservoir, which will basically water all the uh, agroforestry we are making uh, on the hillside. Next one. Uh, well, for the people who are not very clear about Bolivia, it's in the center of uh, South America. It's about 11 million people, mostly indigenous, and it's among the poorest in South America. And then there is both the part uh, of the Andes and the part of the lowland, which is mostly Amazon. Uh, we work mostly in the Andes, between 2,000 meter and 4,000 meter. Next, please. Yeah, this is just to give an uh, impression of a country. Next one. The general themes in Bolivia, or some of the general themes in Bolivia, which we uh, see is uh, First of all, poverty. Most, mostly the people on the countryside, they are, uh, most of them are poor. Then there is um, climate change. There is um, erosion and soil degradation. So it means the soil is getting uh, poorer and poorer and poorer due to a uh, wrong use of the grounds. Next one. The part of the climate change in Bolivia, um, there are two examples here. Um, you can see on the right side, you can see the Chacotaya mountain with the ski jump. Um, and the Chacotaya mountain did have a beautiful glacier which has melted by now completely. So the ski jump is not working uh, anymore either. And on the left side, you see the 
Lake Popo, Laguna Popo. And the lake has uh, largely disappeared. Um, well, different factors from mining to climate change, but uh, climate change is a part in the story. Next one, please. So in the, the themes we are doing in the eco camp, Chokaya eco camp, are uh, agroforestry, of course, water reservoirs, reforestation and water infiltration, and uh, fire prevention. Next one. So uh, the agroforestry, um, we, we do a mix of uh, fruit trees, native trees, and uh, vegetables. And these are uh, really small pieces of land, you know. It could be like uh, 100 fruit trees, mostly apple trees. Apple trees are the cash crop. The native trees, they are the green fertilizers. They, the organic material of the native tree, trees comes on the ground and in the ground. And that, that's uh, making the soil better. And the vegetables uh, are in between, basically. Huh? So you can see some uh, nets to protect the apples from the birds. Next one, please. Um, the water reservoirs, in order to have the agroforestry, to have the fruit trees, uh, well, they need water both in the dry season and uh, in the wet season. So the dry season, of course, is the problem here. Um, so we make this kind of uh, water reservoirs. Um, from concrete, they're quite cheap, but uh, mostly, well, the work is done by the local people. The local communities do the work. Um, and they do pay part of the money as well. And uh, by having water access, uh, you can harvest uh, vegetables more time a year eh? instead of one time a year. Next one. He yeah, had the water infiltration and the reforestation. Um, water infiltration is a very interesting uh, subject and it's a little bit new for us. Um, basically, the water, most water enters on, on the top of the mountains into the ground and uh, it comes in the valleys, it comes out as a spring. Um, it has been like that uh, forever, but nowadays the spring water is getting less and less because the infiltration of the water on the mountain tops is getting less and less. Eh? Um, this is partly because a lot of the original forest is uh, disappearing. And, uh, well, partly it's because of uh, wrong use of uh, agricultural ground again. So, so, indeed, the things you can do there is like uh, water channels you see underneath. A lot of water channels will take care that uh, water sinks into the ground. And uh, planting native trees, or at least protecting the native trees that are there, uh, is, is uh, important as well. The, the native trees, the trees will as well take care that the water enters into the ground. Um, actually, we have some examples now where we have uh, done this. And uh, the, we have some result as well, because the springs underneath in the valley, they, they increase the volume of water again. Yes, fire prevention. Um, there's, well, nowadays everywhere on earth almost has fire problems. 
and here in uh, Bolivia, close to Cochabamba, there's a lot of fire problems as well. Um, and there, to prevent it, there's uh, different things you can do. Eh? Um, well, first of all, if you have a pine forest, for example, you have to cut the lower branches and take care that not all the, the branches, not all the organic materials laying on the ground there, because your forest will just disappear with uh, fire, you know. Um, then there are the things like uh, fire barriers. Eh? Uh, so, so we use cactuses, uh, tuna cactuses, uh, uh, as fire barriers, three layers of this uh, tuna cactus. Uh, and if they're grown up in about five years, it should be enough to stop most fires. Uh, then there is a lot of important work to be done with the community people. Um, well, first of all, they, they shouldn't use their uh, fire to burn their part to burn it uh, clean, eh? to burn their area clean. That's what they still do here. Um, so on communal level, we, we should make um, kind of agreements uh, about not, not using fire for clean burning. And uh, we, you can make local uh, fire fight, fire fighters. Eh? So um, you, we, we give courses to the community people to fight fires and to um, we give them the fire clothes and some equipment as well. And uh, in some communities, this works very well. In other communities, it doesn't work that well. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, this is just a general impression. We make some greenhouses, we do some plastic recycling and the square meter garden. Next one. That's the movie already. Yeah, go for it, I would say. Yeah, that's that's fine. Maybe some last words, and then uh, it's open for questions. Um, so, so uh, we, the foundation works from Holland, Netherlands, gets the money, most of the money from Netherlands, and we are uh, spending the money here in Bolivia. 
and that's in that way of that's the way of work you can do in most from most european countries eh? most rich countries do have funds for this kind of work eh? in poor countries thank you very much for your attention and uh, i leave it open for comments or questions or whatever Thank you so much, Menno. Uh, really interesting to see what's going on um, in a different type of ecosystem and really looking also kind of at these mountain um, based projects um, where you're working on high slopes and in different types of soils um, and with really interesting combinations of, or I think really useful combinations of productive plants um, for sale as well as in, uh, native plants. Um, I think we'll open for questions. Um, and then um, I also wanted to mention um, that if you guys would like to support um, projects like Menno's as well as um, other ecosystem restoration camps, um, if you're based in the US, you can um, Look at the um, link here under ecosystemrestorationcamps.org slash USA to make a contribution um, or find ways to engage with us directly um, at some of our in-person events. And with that, um, I will take the first question I see here from Diana. Um, the floor is yours, Diana. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, um, so interesting. I, I wanted you to go into a lot more detail about your water reservoir. For instance, um, how did you get the water into it? And how do you get the water out of it? You know, do you have pumps or just using gravity? You know, how is it tied into, how do you irrigate? uh how did you build it can you give a lot more detail about your uh water reservoir and how it works yeah i will try so um the water reservoirs yeah they they work on uh, gravity the, to get the water out uh, and to get the water in it's it's uh, mostly it's uh, springs eh? there are springs on the mountain sides which give a little bit of water and uh, you only if you collect the water you can use it effectively eh? if you just let the spring drip drip away then it will not have very much effect so so uh, yeah so there's uh, so there are some tubes connected to the water reservoir there are some tubes going out of the water reservoir and then there are sprinklers who uh, who sprinkle the water around, uh, basically. If you're really interested into uh, how to build it, then you can send me an email and I could uh, probably send you uh, uh, instructions. Oh, OK. Is it, gra is it gravity then that, uh, or do you use um um pumps no it's uh gravity indeed yeah. okay and um i see we have a question um in the chat and then i also see An andrew langford has raised his hand um, the chat question from planet healers is uh, what soil are you working with it looks dry, so how do you increase the moisture holding? Yeah, it, indeed, the, the soil in, in general to start with is poor and uh, in the dry season, very dry as well. Um, so so uh, we need, that's why we need this combination of water reservoirs and um, organic material. Eh? Uh, organic material to get into the ground and to uh, organic material to cover the ground um, and and um, beside that we use some 
before we start, we use some combinations of, um, I, I'm not even sure all that's in it, but I think there's some rock powder and some uh, uh, for kind of natural fertilizers, but I'm not exactly sure what it all is. Uh, so, but the, the, indeed the organic material is the most important part of it, the green fertilizers. Thank you, Menno. Um, please go ahead, Andrew. Hi there, Menno. Uh, we've had a bit of an email correspondence about almonds. Very pleased to be thinking about that with you. Um, so, but I would like to know a little bit more about the climate. Do, uh, do you have frost? And um, I hear you have a dry season and, a, and, a, and, a, and therefore presumably a rainy season. So when's your dry season and when's your rainy season? Yeah, so the rainy season from uh, December till uh, March, more or less, eh? uh -huh. and and uh, well, from May till till kind of uh, October, it's really dry season, eh? okay. um, and and we work on different altitudes, but uh, Chokaya Camp itself doesn't really have frost, uh, but it does have it. Sometimes it could have. Uh, hail hail stones eh? okay okay um but in general the the temperature would be uh um not too cold basically <laughs> okay yes okay great okay that sounds sounds quite like a lot like some parts of california in the usa with a you know, wet, wet winter and a oh but that's your summer isn't it uh southern hemisphere wet summer you have a wet summer and a dry winter that's then, it that's it yes 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 okay great good thanks that's very helpful yeah thanks for the communication uh, going on uh, even yeah, if it's okay. slow <laughs> yeah you don't see any other hands raised does anyone else have a question I, john please go ahead yeah i just um i've been to Bolivia a few times, and uh, I noticed that uh, there was an attempt to connect the upstream water, um, I guess, protectors with the downstream water users, because, the, you know, if the people upstream were taking too much water, the people downstream wouldn't have any water, and, or if they were or they were cutting the trees, then you'd have a lot of runoff, but you wouldn't have a lot of base flow. And there was a, an attempt to use payments for ecosystem services to try to improve that. Do you see that happening? Are you using that kind of thing? Are you working with other organizations who, who do that? Um, well, the one you're talking about, I'm not really sure which it is, um, but but we try to do it on a very local level. Eh? Mm -hmm. So so our our partner organizations work on a very local level. Eh? Uh, um, that would be um, one uh, local government, um, and and one local government could be a mountainside and a valley yeah? um, and so we we try to get the communities together to to cooperate and this can be a real difficult process um, for example in the water infiltration zone there can be for example nine different owners yeah? and some owners want to cooperate and others don't want to cooperate so it can be a process of uh, years before they agree to uh, to do the replanting of the trees and to do the uh, infil uh, infiltration channels eh? uh, so to be short we work on a very local level and we try to multiply it to other uh, uh, local governments John. So, so how many people are you serving? How many people are working in your projects? Well, if we by now we have been planting uh, almost one and a half million trees, eh? um, 
but not all of it is agroforestry. Yeah? Some, some of it is uh, native trees, some, some of it is pine trees as well, non-native pine trees. Yeah? Um, so the agroforestry is the most effective and useful way, yeah? uh, both to get economic interest and environmental interest together. And I think we have had about, uh, in total, a kind of six, 700 farmers small farmers by now. Thank you. Great. Um, for folks who are just joining us, um, we are in the, the question and answer section for Menno, um, who's leading the work in Camp Tokaya. If anyone has any questions, please either raise your hand um, with your video on or um, you can write us a question in the chat, or you can raise your hand using the Zoom feature. Mm. Menno, I have a question for you. Um, if I can jump ahead of Kath, if that's okay. Um, I was curious about um, what are some of the, the biggest challenges that you have in establishing um, new vegetative cover in some of these air areas? Um, is it finding the right combination of plants? Is it the water component? Um, is it the soil? Um, is it the maintenance kind of what are what are some of the, the biggest challenges and how have you been um, organizing around those? Well, actually, uh, difficult can be working with the local people. Um, if there is an economic interest for the local people, they will work together with us and they will join into the projects. Basically, this means uh, agroforestry is an economic interest for them because of the fruit trees, of course. Eh? If, if you get to any other project, it's, it's getting more difficult. So if you want to plant native trees on the mountains, uh, for the water infiltration or for the for the uh, erosion, for example, eh, it gets difficult, uh, and and um, you might have to do an exchange on some uh, other level. Eh? Uh, for for example, uh, if you say, yeah, we work together with you on the on the lower hillside with agroforestry and with uh, water reservoirs. Then on the higher hillside, we want to have native trees. And this is our exchange. In, in this way, it can work. Uh, but if you just want to plant native trees for the environmental uh, thing, not so much chance. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Kath Ritchie. Please go ahead, Kath. Thank you. Menno, I'm particularly fascinated with what you're doing with planting uh, the cacti or the, the cacti. I can't remember the name of the species that you mentioned specifically. Um, I was just keen to know whether is this a species that has been tried and tested uh, in terms of effectiveness for combating or as, as a fire, natural fire barrier before? And is it specifically this species of cactus or is it that the one you're planting because it's native or easily available or it grows quickly or I'm just I'm yeah I just I'd like to know why why this species and and has it got proven proven effectiveness and and how many years does it take to to reach a point where it could um, provide an, an an effective fire barrier thank you yeah I, I guess it takes about four or five years to get uh, effective barrier huh? Um, how scientific is it? Not completely. Um, it, it has not been, uh, it has not really been proven uh, on a kind of universal, by universities or something. Um, but we now we work together with the university to, uh, to both grow the cactuses and to plant them out. Eh? Um, so you could say it's um, that it's more or less on an experimental level. Um, 
but on the other hand, it's kind of logic as well. Like uh, um, if you want to have fire barriers for, uh, well, fires which are not enormous, but fires which are kind of in between or middle, um, any way, any barrier you can think of, it can be a road, it, uh, it, it can be a waterway, it can be a hilltop, uh, uh, anything can be effective. Eh? It, of course, the situation is different than in California here. <laughs> Thank you, Menno. Um, I think we also, in some regions, refer to this species of cactus as nopal um, in Mexico and, and in other um, areas. And um, Kath, since I, I know you, I will uh, forward a conversation so we can keep talking further, but um, that particular plant has a lot of really great applications for dry land restoration. Um, it stores a lot of water. It produces an edible fruit. Um, the leaves are edible and they're also often used for forage um, for animals. So, um, and fi fire barriers, there are a lot of um, really interesting uses for that particular plant. Um, so really exciting that you guys are, are using that um, in your project as well. Um, I will pass the microphone to Michael Polarski, who has his hand raised for a question. Hi there. <clears throat> Just a quick note on that cactus. Look at Kauai. They have huge, I mean, gigantic, 20 foot tall, giant tuna cactus, I mean, pad cactuses. And one thing to do with them once you have a lot of them is you can cut part of them down and bury them in trenches for garden areas. And you can make a really good garden area by turning some of the cactus, which grow in some of the most inhospitable dry situations imaginable on Kauai, probably like a five inch rainfall zone. At any rate, check that out. Um, so I had actually two questions. One is a little bit, it has a little prelude in that uh, recently I've been reading international literature that's been saying that agroforestry is one of the best ways you can get people to plant trees and that it's tried and true in all these countries. And so people really believe in it. And so your experience there is that agroforestry, once again, is what the selling ticket is. My question is, of the million and a half trees you've planted, how many are still alive? Or how many were destined for a quick death anyway, because they be their pioneer species. But I'm just curious, because everybody plants trees and some have a really high success rate, some have a really low success rate. And it's the success rate is really, of course, more important than the number. So I'm just curious, uh, and everybody loses some. I mean, you never get 100%, but I'm curious how you're doing. Yes, so how many of the, how, what percentage of the trees died, uh, basically? Yeah, um, yeah this, this is uh, differs, eh? like uh, if it's uh, fruit trees, we, there's quite a high survival of the fruit trees bec because, because of the same reason, there are economical uh, benefits. Eh? Um, so, so I think that's about 10%. 10-15% dies of the fruit trees. Um, of the native trees, it, this is much higher. Eh? This will be at least 30% of it. Um, um, and sometimes um, it's even worse than that. Um, depend, so the, na for example, a lot of native trees which Fine. we plant, uh, they, they have to survive on the rainwater. Eh? And if there's uh, one year without rain, uh, problems and high uh, mortality. Uh, um, did you have another question as well? <laughs> uh, just really quickly, if the people had the, the go local governments, the local people have a say in how the land is used around here, can they make a decision to save or take care of land? or is the decision out of their hands? Do they have control over their own, of the land there, I guess? Is it all private? Um, most of it is private. Some of it is uh, communal. Uh, so the private land, they have their own say in it and the communal land, 
uh, they have to decide communal, of course, eh, with the village. Um, and um, so, so mo that's why uh, most people on the communal land want to have pine trees for productive reasons, eh? uh, to cut it down in uh, 14 and 22 years, uh, to have wood to construct something. Eh? Um, yeah, and, and whereas we try to push the native trees with limited success. Well, the, well, we need native trees that give them pr production and then, you know, so yeah, production and native, but I must go, but thank you for your great work. And hello to everybody. Bye-bye. Michael, if you are able to stay for one more second, I'm hoping you could um, maybe share the information about your upcoming course. Okay, sure. Um, I'm putting on a ecosystem restoration course in Washington State, USA, uh, June 7th to 17th. And of course, all of you are really busy and far away, probably. But if you know anybody in our region or somebody that would, would want to take an ecosystem restoration course, uh, we're doing one. And uh, I guess I would just say Global Earth Repair Foundation org but i'll be back i'm going to do this annually and so i'm so i'm going to invite all your friends you you hang on <laughs> great thank you so much okay bye bye do we have any other questions for Mano? I also have one, one follow-up question for you, Menno. Um, so you've worked mainly um, in an area that, that's pretty close to a, a major city in Bolivia. Um, would you, have you guys considered projects in other sites um, or are you really um, happy to focus on the particular place where um, you've been doing your work? Um, there's a lot of agriculture um, in those valley regions, um, as well as deforestation and, and degradation issues in other ecosystems in the country. Um, are you looking into some of those areas or are you focusing primarily on this site? Uh, well, Aaron, um, actually we work um, in, in the, both in the departments of uh, La Paz, North Potosi and Cochabamba. Eh? So it, it's not only the Chacotaya eco camp. Eh? Um, it, it's a lot wider than that, but it's all in the Andes Mountains. Eh? Uh, all in, well, situations which are recognizable. Eh? Um, and then there, of course, there is the part of Bolivia, which is the lowland and uh, among it, the Amazon part, and and there are the really big problems. Eh? Uh, there, the forest is disappearing very quickly. Eh? Um, but it's it's such a different uh, ecosystem. Um, it it deserves to have its projects, eh? and sometimes we consider to go there, but it didn't really take off until now. <laughs> Great. Well, as you um, expand those projects, we'll be really happy to keep um, collaborating with you and supporting um, as that work grows. I just, I just wanted to ask: Do the do you have some way of um, engaging the local people in decision making besides just participating? in um, agroforestry, do they, do they become part of the management or are they empowered in other ways? Yeah, John, to a certain degree, um, but it, it might be done even to a larger degree. Um, well, of, of course we give them the knowledge of, of uh, agroforestry, how to maintain the ground and uh, st stuff like that. Eh? And of course they have their uh, uh, local decision-making in the villages, eh? like uh, 
uh, do they want to restore a mountainside or not? Eh? Or till what, till what degrees do they want to restore a mountainside? Eh? So they have a large say in that. Um, but but maybe you're even thinking of uh, of uh, having them to uh, design uh, area, eh? and and that's not something we are we don't do that uh, yet. Um, so there uh, maybe there's more possible than what we do. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, I see also that we have a question um, in the chat that is more general. Um, it's about a particular type of practice called farmer managed natural regeneration, which is a type of coppicing um, tree management system. And Robert Hayes asks, can anyone speak about the success of farmer managed natural regeneration for forestry management and tree survival? So I think this is a little bit more of a general question about that type of practice. Um, I don't know if anyone in the group would like to um, talk about it generally. Anyone um, who is here is welcome to make a comment about that. And Kath, go ahead. I can't personally speak to it, but um, I do know that Camp Green Pop, um, who operate out of South Africa, but also have projects in Zambia, have been quite involved in doing training at their project site near Livingston in Zambia um, with the community to show them that way of managing the land. And in fact, in our newsletter about three months ago, we included a brief overview of, of how they're doing this. But if anyone would like to reach out to camp manager Misha Teasdale via their webpage on the ERC website, I'm sure that Misha would be happy to uh, speak at length about the successes uh, or not that they have had with, with implementing that technique. So it's, it's another continent, I appreciate that, but I think the, the, the concept behind it is probably the same. Um, I have a film on my uh, you, YouTube Kat. on farmer-based farmer uh, natural regeneration um, that follows the work of, um, what, what, what's his name from, from um, World Vision in uh, Australia. He got a major prize because of that. Several prizes, actually. Um, it's quite a excellent uh, thing. Um, I'll uh, anyway. It's on the. I'll see if I can find it and put it up into the chat. Thank you so much, John. Um, right. Shall we? Tony Ronaldo's work with World Vision, and he won the Land for Life Award many, many years ago. I don't know how many years ago, 10 or 15. Yeah, I'm really familiar with farmer managed natural regeneration being used um, in the African region. Um, in Central and South America, I have not seen that um, as a technique um, used as frequently. I'm not as aware of as many examples. We have another question for Menno from Joey. How does your ecosystem, your eco restoration camp affect local livelihoods? So you talked a little bit about um, fruit production. Um, are there other local livelihoods that are, are connected with the project that you're developing? Uh, local livelihood meaning uh, animals and stuff? No, local livelihoods usually refers to economic opportunities um, that might come out of a project. So um, job opportunities, uh, other types of productive chains that might be part of this type of a system. If I understood right. that, okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, no, it, it, this is uh, positive, actually. Um, the mostly with the agroforestry the income will will increase and it some in some cases it can increase actually uh quite a lot like uh two or three times as much as uh normal food production eh? 
so say they are growing potatoes or once a year or mice once a year huh? um, and you replace it with agroforestry including the water reservoir um, the, so there then you can produce the whole year round uh, and the apples have uh, they they sell good huh? so so yeah the income can increase two three times uh, in this way great thank you so i think we've finished the um q and a section i don't see any more questions coming in um we usually use the rest of this time um, if people have projects that they want to share um, more general questions that they want to discuss about restoration um, strategies so that the folks on the line can participate in that conversation um, and it will be open to everyone um, who's here on, on the call um, so i think with that we will anyone who wants to jump off the call at this point, um, please feel free to do so. And we will leave the conversation open for everybody to chat, um, share, discuss for about the next um, half hour. So thank you guys. For those who do have to leave, thank you for joining us. Um, and please go ahead, I see Phoenix. Please make sure to un unmute um, yourself. Sorry, let me just get situated here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Let me see. Yes. We, can you hear me We now? can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you so much, John, for inviting me. Uh, John and I have been talking uh, quite a bit about a project that I've been working on with the Navajo Nation, uh, which is the largest landowner in the United States. And we're really excited to bring these techniques to them um, and really doing the groundwork initially laying the foundation to um, really bring the education and inspire them to wanna to take this on and, and lead it themselves. And so we're working on developing that strategy as a written proposal. And so anything that I can use to present to them that can clearly outline, you know, what, what ecosystem restoration camps can do as far as support. Um, I know there's some videos that are really great, um, but there's actually, there's also funding through the US Department of Interior. Um, and so it's pre-development funding, which I think uh, this would qualify for. And so we're connected directly with the main decision maker because they really wanna expedite the funding process because there's been a lot of bottlenecks in the past. And the current administration really wants to push this through to hang their hat on before the re-election and so they're they're actually wanting to build 50,000 homes which um is quite the feat and they're starting with uh pre-development so this would be part of that and so anything that we can present to them i know john thinks uh and i think also that it would be really important to start with uh creator space and a maker space along with a central kitchen and a central event space. Um, we, I don't wanna blur it too much, but um, we're really close to getting funded for a, a holistic wellness center that would be working with some different evidence-based healing practices and potentially also working with psychedelic therapies. And so that's how I got into this initially. And then um, by being connected with John, who's the main decision maker on this project, he's um, kind of asked me to 
help him with some of the pre-development. And so that's why I reached out to uh, J. John L. <laughs> to, to see how we could work together. So if anybody feels inspired by this project and wants to help, um, I'll go ahead and drop my email into the chat. I think Erin might be a good person to talk with. She's in charge of the, she's directing the foundation. So Erin is probably the right person. Okay. Thanks, Don. Yeah, Phoenix, that sounds like a really amazing um, initiative that you're working on. And um, it sounds like maybe there might be some other people on the call who are interested in, in what that um, might look like. So we can certainly um, get in touch and I can give you whatever information you need to help you um, understand and, and share more about what ecosystem restoration camps um, does and can support um, as, a, as a, a type of coordinating um, and networking entity. Um, so we can definitely continue that discussion. Um, and it sounds like some other folks are interested in hearing a little bit more about your project. So um, we have one question for you about whether um, you're looking at prairie restoration um, and if you're looking at um, grazing animals like, like bison. Yeah, it's, it's really um, right at the beginning stages and it's depending on, you know, which part of the world that we're in. Um, it could be within the high desert of, of Arizona, potentially, and Saunders, Arizona. And so, you know, I'm not an expert on any of this. And so if anybody has experience with working with that kind of climate, and uh, I think with what John was saying, you know, really starting with a focus on economic development. And so if, you know, doing more of uh, fruit trees and uh, food forests would be a good place to start. Um, but yeah, definitely with, with livestock also, I think that would also um, play into the economic growth. So, yeah, I think that would be great. Very cool. Um, we have some folks who have been involved directly with camps on this call. Um, one of the things I think that is really special about ecosystem restoration camps is the, the network approach we take um, and really finding um, solidarity and support through the connections um, with projects who are doing restoration activities on the ground um, so that your project doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel like you're kind of taking on um, these activities on your own um, and that there really is this community of folks who have the technical knowledge, who have access to the financial resources um, and to the volunteer support to take on a project like that. Um, so yeah, getting you connected with um, other partners who are doing that work as well as some of the networks of knowledge and, and, and other types of resources that are available um, is something that we look to support. And I see that Andrew has his hand raised, so please go ahead, Andrew. Okay, yeah, this, this relates uh, both to the uh, whole of the ecosystem restoration network, but also specifically to Menno um, with his work in Bolivia, because we've been having this conversation about Menno's desire from, for some species of almond, which he knows about from Spain, which makes me suspicious that they might be hard shell rather than the soft shell uh, almonds which are grown in California okay uh, and it raises the question well there are all all manner of useful species around the world and it would be great if we could move them around a bit um, and uh, but I know that there are all these phytosanitary barriers to you know like to importing um, germ uh, plant germplasm from one country to another and so on and i know there are some ways that you can you know you can you can take cuttings and put it in test tubes of decidedly poisoned toxic um, pesticides and get it through 
that way because nothing else other than the plant material could survive that kind of treatment. So what I'm looking for, I need help. Well, I need help to find out what are the routes and the methods for us to be able to relatively informally move plant germplasm around so that we can increase the range of valuable species uh, that, for example, Menno could be using for planting in his systems, but other people could be also using. Because I, what I notice is that having recently spent a few years in California, I notice that there's dozens of different rootstocks and um, fruiting uh, uh, top parts of plants available there. And then you go to somewhere like Mexico and it's like you can find maybe one or two varieties of something. So there's a, there's a sort of like a, a variety uh, paucity in many parts of the world, which the first world could pay some attention to, you know, gifting useful varieties that are, you know, more drought hardy or hard shell and therefore don't get all of the diseases which soft shell almonds do, just as an example. For anybody who's got experience of moving plant material around the world, I'd mm -hmm. love to have your emails and to start a conversation about how we might do that as an organized process. Check. Indeed, indeed. Thank you uh, for taking it up. Uh, uh, I, indeed, how to find the correct far, far, uh, kind of uh, species, eh? the far, far, how do you say that in, in English, the variety, eh? uh -huh. and to how to transport it, actually. That's the second thing. And uh, I, I know there's loads of uh, useful tree species uh, which we could use in Bolivia, but I'm not sure how to get them here and uh, the exact correct species. I think someone has accidentally shared their screen. Well, um, just to you know, take a stab at that question that Andrew and Minno are interested in, this is a really kind of serious uh, area because there's quite a lot of international uh, relations surrounding moving um, of uh, plants. Um, there are agricultural quarantines and this sort of thing. I highly recommend working with the botanical gardens, um, Kew Gardens, and then there's an association of all the botanical gardens around the world. And they know pretty much what's what what you need to do in order to move these these uh, species around, and you have to be very careful with this because, like California, you know they want to search your vehicle and everything when you come in because you might be bringing in some fruit or something. You're not supposed to do that, so you have to be very very careful with that. Um, and you know, of course, Darwin went around the world and just collected everything and no one, you know, there was no regulation at that time. So that's how a lot of material went around the world. But uh, I, I would say that that's something that we should, we should study carefully and find a, a, a true person who's de devoted their lives to this and, uh, and get them uh, together on a podcast or on a, on a presentation and find out exactly what what's with that. I'll look into that a little bit. I'm, I'm interested too. I like your suggestion that we would perhaps see whether we can ally with botanical gardens. That's a very good motion, John. I appreciate that. And they will have, of course, all of the necessary wariness about avoiding bringing in plants that have a possibility of being invasive. Um, so, in, yeah. Maybe quite a lot of of legacy genome 
in somewhere, you know, there, it may be kept somewhere carefully. And if we mm -hmm. can, one of the things we're talking about and headed to California right now with this work with prisons to create botanical sanctuaries in the prisons. Mm -hmm. So this could be quite interesting to see, to see if that is, is at all possible. Okay. We, I think well, that, that is that variety um, in both productive species, so species like that we use for agriculture um, and for food production um, is something that is really well, um, let's say regulated and that there are already really strong international processes for which countries can import um, productive species for use. Um, for that reason, we have pink lady apples in Mexico and, um, and we have uh, prickly pear cacti, cacti in uh, some grocery stores in Pennsylvania. Um, so I, I think you're, you're right that using those um, institutions that are available, especially um, in the Western hemisphere for, um, for cooperation on these types of productive species is, is really useful. Um, I see we have Leo with his hand raised. Hello, good to see everyone and meet some new folks. I'm calling in from what they call California, um, Eco Camp Coyote. And in this kind of open time of the talk, I would like to pitch our event. Uh, we're having an event this weekend. It's a fire mimicry event and a, uh, a TEK, traditional ecological knowledge event. And the mobile kitchen is going to be there. We're going to have a, this giant solar oven and a mobile cob pizza oven and uh, biogas. And we're going to be cooking with solar power and biodiesel power and bicycle power. And I'm excited about all those things. And that's not even what the course is about, but um, it's about how we can return some of the California landscapes back to a place where um, fires wouldn't be so catastrophic and how we can leverage our agency and hopefully be informed by the indigenous folks and their wisdom of uh, how we can do that in a, in a good way. So it's looking like maybe something like 50 people will be there. And if you're in the area, come by and I'll put the link in the chat. Oh, it looks like Kath is on it. Thank you, Kath. Yay, good to see everyone. Very exciting in three short days. So we're sure you're doing a lot of coordination. Yeah. Leo. So good luck with your event. Your... Yeah. Bye for. Yeah, love what you guys are working on at, at Eco Camp Coyote. Anyone else want to jump in? Well, it's great to see that we have all of these cool projects coming up, um, all of these independent efforts where people are really understanding the context of where they're working with the communities that they're working in, um, what the priorities are um, for working with diverse types of species of plants um, and really understanding how those plants and the ecosystem functions on the landscape can work together. Um, John, it looks like you are driving. If you would like to have the last word. Okay, great. Um, in that case, um, I think we'll, we'll conclude our conversation for today. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say thanks to everybody. I've got uh, another 15 hours to go, so I better get on the road. Thanks so much.
<laughs> Great. Um, and I think we have a really interesting comment in the chat by Mariel Bueno Cordero, um, talking a little bit more about um, you know, these questions around native species and how we integrate those um, and prioritize um, as uh, native species and productive species in a landscape um, that's resilient for some of the climate changes that we're seeing that for the, the people um, and the communities that are part of those landscapes um, and as well as the biodiversity. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us and particularly thank you Menno for um, taking time from your project to share what you're doing. Um, we're really excited to see this work grow and to support um, more um, diverse agricultural and, and conservation landscapes in Bolivia. And um, we hope to have you back here again soon. And thank you, thank everyone. You. Um, thank you, Karen, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone who has been there. Uh, it, it was nice to uh, to be talking and to listening as well. Um, and thanks for all your efforts into the ERC. Thank you so much. You guys have a wonderful day, and we will see you next month um, with the, the Ecosystem Restoration Camp in the Netherlands. Be well. Bye. Bye bye. Hasta luego. Thank you, Aaron. Adios. Nos vemos. Muchas gracias.